good morning and welcome to EAG Church Online. My name is John and we are so honored to have you joining us today. Hey, if you've just arrived, why not leave us a comment telling us who you're watching with and where you're watching from? Or if you've got something more personal and serious that you would like to share with us, you can put that in the comments as well, or you can message us privately, either through social media or our website, www.eagrm.org. Just drop us a line, and we'll get back to you right away. Now it's just about time for Sunday morning to get started. So if you haven't already, right now is the perfect time to get a bottle in one hand and your trusty water bottle in the other to stay hydrated. So let's get ready for another great morning of worshiping God and hearing from His Word at Online Church. You thought I was going to drink from this, didn't you? <laughs> Psych! Psalm 96, 1 through 9 says, Sing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord, bless His name, proclaim His salvation from day to day. Declare, declare His glory among the nations, His wondrous works among all peoples. For the Lord is great and He's highly praised. He is feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before Him. Strength and beauty are are in his sanctuary ascribe to the lord you families of the people ascribe to the lord the glory of his name bring an offering and enter his courts worship the lord in splendor of his holiness let the whole earth tremble before him amen let's clap our hands and let's sing a new song by singing an old song
God. Everyone, good to see you here today. Glad that you're tuning in here at EAG Church in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. You know, if you watch the news or, or study or do different things, that every now and again you hear somebody talk about something that's Orwellian. And it's an adjective describing a situation, idea, or societal condition that George Orwell identified as being destructive to the welfare of a free and open society. And it happens through propaganda, surveillance, disinformation, denial of truth, and manipulation of the past. And it can be seen in the novel he wrote in 1949, which was called 1984. Let me just talk about that for a minute to, to, to get us started here, and I want you to follow with me. The story in the novel 1984 takes place in an imagined future, in the year 1984. Again, he was writing this in 1949. And what has happened that the world has been fallen victim for, to war, uh, omnipresent government, surveillance, propaganda. And so a fictional country is now ruled by Big Brother. He's in charge in the party. And it employs the thought police to monitor everyone's thoughts and behavior and prosecute people for exhibiting even the small, smallest sign of individuality. A central theme of Oral's novel is the power that language holds as a method of mind control. He demonstrates the power of words. This idea is manifested through new speak, which is the new language that the party is rewriting, which aims to replace old speak by removing words from the dictionary rather than adding them. For instance, the opposite word to good becomes ungood instead of bad. And so by limiting people's language and narrowing the range of their thought, Big Brother in the party in this fictional world can keep the masses ignorant and unconscious of, by brainwashing uh, them where thought is a crime. Now, mind control in 1984 passes through different stages. First, by banning thought. Second, by spreading lies and employing slogans that uh, every now and then to brainwash the minds of the masses. Third, by falsifying history and records so that all the facts recorded from the past make them relevant only to the new society that they have, the ruling party. And fourth, by indoctrinating young children at school and encourage them to report to the thought police if they see or observe their parents doing anything outside what well, you know, should be the norm of the society. Now, if you're paying attention and you hear, hear what I just said, and you, you put that in, in the spectrum of where we live, we can see, for instance, that progressive never use words related to socialism or Marxism or communism. Instead, they use words like universal health care, reproductive rights, community organizing, instead of you know, just saying socialized medicine or abortion or communion. Communism, excuse me, we just had recently our, our latest Supreme Court justice was asked to define woman. Uh, she, she didn't do it. She didn't want to do it because, you know, our society is trying to change what words mean. Now, today's message is the last in the series of the elephant in the room. 
And for the last several weeks, we've been talking about things that everybody's thinking about, but nobody's talking about. Today, I want to talk about something you might not be thinking about, but you should be thinking about. And the title of today's message is the best I could come up with. I'm just going to call it the Christian elephant. I want to talk about something very basic to our Christian life and how God works in our lives. And my hope for you is that you experience the power of God and that power will grow as we continue, you know, to to see what his word says and we apply ourselves to it. Now, Jesus wants us to be strong in him and the power of his might. He wants us to live lives that are an example to people around us of his power working in us and through us that they might say, hey, listen, that's not just natural. That's supernatural. That is a God thing. Now, Now, part of that has to do with the words we speak. Words have power, even if they're spoken by someone who's not necessarily a Christian. For instance, in, in JFK in 1961, John F. Kennedy uh, said that he would put a man on the moon by 1969. Lo and behold, I remember when I was in school, they would put all of us kids in one room, and we would watch all of those Apollo space launches. And in July 1969, Apollo 11 landed on the moon using a computer that had 1,300 times less computing power than most of your iPhones that you hold in your hand. In 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. gave his I Have a Dream speech at the Lincoln Memorial, and his words initiated a a new America, a, a new era in American culture. Words have power. When you say something, it unleashes something. The Bible says we were created in the image of God. What does that mean? I think part of it means that in Genesis 1, we find in the creation that God spoke and it was so. God said, let there be light and there was light. And I think that we have some of that creation power in the words that we say. Every day, you and I create the context of our lives in the way that we speak. It affects our marriage, our kids. Words can divide. Words can discourage. Words can create unity and synergy. Words can destroy. Our words can create a blessed marriage or a broken marriage. Some of you still live today by words that somebody spoke to you in your life, whether good or bad, whether it was a parent, a teacher, a coach, some significant person. They spoke something to you. I've, I've mentioned to you before about I had a teacher in school, that I wasn't doing all that well in school, I thought. This was after my father had died when I was still young. And I remember this teacher back in the old-fashioned days where you had the report card that you would get and had to take home, that they would make comments, you know, underneath all the the letter grades that they gave you. And she wrote something to defect this lady, you know, this one you don't have to worry about. Well, I, here I am, many, many, many years later, I'm still thinking about what we said because what I thought to myself, I have a lot to worry about. There's a lot of things going on that I'm not sure about, but yet she spoke that life. In fact, Proverbs 18.21 said, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now, sometimes in our conversations, the elephant in the room is the words and the language that we use. That's the elephant in the room. And so let's pray, and then we're going to talk about it for a little bit. Father, I thank you for your word today, Lord. We're going to look at many scriptures, and I I pray, Lord, that that you'll speak into our hearts these truths. Lord, help us to open our minds right now to a little bit new learning. Help us to open our hearts, Lord, to a little bit of newer transformation that you want to do for us. And Father, I thank you that your Holy Spirit will speak to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we get so used to saying things that we think it conveys the essence of what we want to say. Now, let me, let me carefully throw this out there, okay? I think the word Christian doesn't mean to other people what we think it means. Now, language is no small challenge. So often communicate even in our best relationships. You say something that you think communicates what you want to say, it just goes right by the other person. And you can get in little arguments in your home about it or biblical discussions, whatever you want to call. You know, I said, but they heard something different. For example, if I were to tell you when I was a kid uh, that I used to go down to uh, a store called Razabonis and I would get a, a, a meatball grinder and an orange tonic, you might not know what I'm talking about. But I was just telling you I was getting a meatball sub and an orange soda. But where I grew up, that's how we would say it. I remember one time when I first came to North Carolina, I was riding in somebody uh, and they said, listen, I need to stop and throw this in the boot and I need to go in the store and get me a pack of nabs. I had no idea what they were talking about. Well, the boot was the trunk and nabs was what I call like peanut butter crackers. And, And so language means and says different things. 
There was a story where after church, Johnny tells his parents he has to go talk to the minister right now. They agree, and the pastor greets the family. Pastor Johnny says, I heard you say today that our bodies came from the dust. That's right, Johnny. I did, he says. And I heard you say that when we die, our bodies go back to dust. Yes, I'm glad you were listening. The pastor, why do you ask all this? He said, well, you need to come over to my house right away and look under my bed because there's someone either coming or going. So the things that we say, and, and, and depending on levels of education and whatever, it means different things. When I take a couple through marriage premarital counseling, I say that guys speak mainly in ideas, they like headlines, telling you what they think. Women tend to, and these are not absolutes, but, but women tend to tell you what they feel. And when you're having a conversation like that, and she will say something, and, and it's just full of feelings, that she'd been thinking about for a while, and he thinks it's a thought. But she's just poured her heart out. And he says something that just devastates her because she thinks he's been feeling that for a long time, but only he thought about it two seconds ago. So, so, so communication can be missed. There are some words that are close but not exact. We could say that Jesus was innocent, but he wasn't naive. Other words have lost their meaning or changed their meaning or morphed into other meanings. There is a sense that the word Christian has come to that and we need to be aware of it. I'm not asking to buy into what I'm saying, but just listen through this. Personally, I use it all the time and you do too. And among ourselves, we understand each other. And our understanding a Christian is someone who follows Jesus. But there are many places in the world that when you say that, they're hearing something different. Everything from the Inquisition to the Crusades, the average unchurched person you meet on the street today that hasn't been in church or, or does not understand what, what we mean by it, they would think Christians are, are bigoted or they're narrow-minded or a bunch of angry old white people or whatever. And, and once a word has to be identified and explained, it loses the essence of what it's about. So, so that's where we have come, I think. So let's just see how the New Testament uses this word Christian. It shows up three times in the Bible. First of all, in Acts 11, 25 and 26, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So the word was used to describe people who just were talking about Jesus all the time. In Acts 26, 28, then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can convince me to be a Christian? And then in 1 Peter 4.16, Peter says, However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. And so what's clear is that the early Christians didn't really call themselves that per se all the time. It was referred to in these three times. They were called other things like troublemakers and the followers of the way. Uh, but here we are today and Christianity has to be defined and modified and explained. Someone asks, are you a Christian? And you say, yeah. And they say, what kind? Are you born again Christian? You're a carnal Christian? You're a CEO Christian or Christmas Easter only? Are you a spirit filled Christian? Are you Baptist, Pentecostal? What flavor are you? What's your brand? In 1998, Dr. Bill Bright of Campus Crusade for Christ sent a letter to all his staffers, literally hundreds of thousands of people at this time, and the title of his letter was Don't Call Us Christians. Now, you see, this is all sent to Christian people, but he said, don't call us Christians. And in it, he talks about a dream he had where he's standing before kings and princes and rulers and, and, and leaders of organizations and countries all over the world where, where, where Campus Crusade for Christ would go. He said, don't use the word Christian because it had become encumbered with all kinds of things. Nowhere in the Bible can I find that we are to be called Christians. Some people say Jesus was the founder of Christianity, but that's not true. And it's not biblical. He came to express the Father's heart so that we could be redeemed. Jesus wasn't the founder of a, some structure or organization or system. He came to give us life and to give it more abundantly. Richard Halverson, former chaplain of the Senate, said, Jesus did not come to call us Christians. He called us to be new creations. In fact, the Bible says that we are, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. We think differently, we act differently, we speak differently, our life is different. Now, I'm not saying we should stop using the word, but it depends on what kind of conversation that we want to have as to what language we use. We need to be careful to use language that doesn't convey more than we intend or less than we intend. 
Someone said that when you write a business letter, you don't want to write it so you can be understood. You want to write it so you cannot possibly be misunderstood. Okay? So the question is not about language that we want to use or even the words, but what is the conversation that we want to have? So I'm going to veer off course for just a minute here, a couple minutes. And I want to talk about power of words in the context of three conversations that we have. The first conversation is a conversation that we have with ourselves. Let me start by saying that outside of prayer, which is our conversation with God, obviously, the next most important conversation that we have is with ourselves on a daily basis. In other words, what do you tell yourself about yourself? What we say has a lot to do with, with what we end up accomplishing or not accomplishing. When people are constantly saying self-defeating things, when people are saying things about themselves to themselves that are negative, it has a devastating effect on their life when every day they, they get up and they look in the mirror and they think, I'm a failure, you know, I'm not good enough, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, not able to do, I can't, you know, and it's all negative. Friends, it will affect their life. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Yet you speak negative things, you are weakening yourself, you're working against God's will and his words for your life. Words bring life and power. What Satan wants to do is he wants to see us weak. So he encourages all that kind of stuff. We are surrounded by people all the time. What, what, do, you, what do you see a lot of times on social media? Someone will be posting pictures and they'll be like, this is the best vacation ever. This is you know, the best wedding party ever. This is the best ever. And so if you see a lot of that and you're not able to do much, you, you, you get to thinking, hey, your life has not experienced anything that's good. In 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, the Bible says, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. And so the Bible says we've got to learn how to control our soul. And, and how do we do that? We take every thought captive to obey Christ. Be because if we're thinking down that line, we're not thinking the thoughts that Jesus thinks about us. He tells us we're seated in heavenly places with him. He tells us that we can do all things through Christ. He, he tells us that we are more than conquerors and on and on and on the promises in the scriptures go. And so the Bible says we don't let our soul dictate and tell us what to do. We've got to follow the Spirit's leading and destroy the arguments by taking those thoughts captive and submitting them to Christ and have them changed. In Psalm 62, 5 and 6, it says, For God alone. O oh, my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. David is talking to himself. He says, I'm not going to be shaken. In Psalm 116, 7, return, O oh, my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has bountifully dealt with you. In Psalm 103, 1 and 2, bless the Lord, O oh, my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh, my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. And then underneath all that begins to list some of those benefits. What's happening here? Saul is talking to his soul. Say, listen, get back on board. In Psalm 42, 5 and 6, it says, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for will I yet praise him, my Savior, my God? My soul is downcast within me, therefore I remember you. Sometimes we listen to ourselves too much. What's interesting is, is David says this three times really quickly. Psalm 42, 5, why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why you're in turmoil, hope in God? The same thing, almost the same words in Psalm 42, 11, Almost exactly the same in Psalm 43, 5. You know, why are you downcast, O oh my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. So, so this is what David learned to do. And David was hunted down by King Saul. David faced many enemies. David had all kinds of turmoil in his life. And, and what did he learn to do? To, to not listen to what the world was saying, not even say those negative things to himself, but to, to, to get his soul to be uplifted. And so we've got to keep talking to ourselves. We are in a battle. Like I said, David, in, 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 in three consecutive Psalms here, he's, he's doing this. He's replacing those negative thoughts with the word of God. And that's how we live in victory. We've got to do this. David Martin Lloyd-Jones was a great preacher from the last century. He preached at Westminster Chapel for over 25 years. And this is what he had to say in, in, a, in his book, Spiritual Depression. 
The main art of spiritual living is to know how to handle yourself. You have to take yourself in hand. You have to address yourself, preach to yourself, question yourself. You must say to your soul, why art thou cast down? What business have you to be disquieted? You must turn on yourself, upbraid yourself, exhort yourself, and say to yourself, hope in God instead of muttering in this depressed and unhappy way. And then you must go on to remind yourself of God, who God is what God has done, what God has pledged himself to do. And then having done that, end on this great note, defy yourself, defy other people, defy the devil and the whole world and say with this man, I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance, who is also the health of my countenance and my God. The essence of this matter is to understand that this self of ours, this other man within us, had got to be handled. Do not listen to him. Turn on him, speak to him, upbraid him, exhort him, encourage him, remind him of what you know instead of listening placidly to him and allowing him to drag you down and depress you. That's what we're talking about. And I can just say this. Some Christians have no victory because they let their soul dominate their life and their thinking with faulty thinking. All because of being influenced by the enemy, influenced by negative thinking, and a lack of input from God's word. So what this all comes to, basically, is what the Bible tells us to do in Romans 12. Our minds need to be renewed with the word of God so that we don't go down that negative path with the way that we talk to ourselves. We go in that positive direction, reminding ourselves of what God's word says. The second conversation I want to talk about is a conversation that we have with others. The words we say can create an environment that can bring people together or drive them apart. We know that. Anyone married knows this to be true. The way we talk to one another is going to determine, you know, the health and vitality of the joy that we have in our relationships. Words create the context of the life in which we live. You, you know people that are just always negative. You know, they're, they're not the kind of people you want to hang around for very long because that just drags you down. But you also know the people that are uplifting and they're, they're just full of life. And you want to hear what they have to say. Wherever they are, you gravitate toward them because the things that they say just bless you. Proverbs 10.21 says, The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of sense. Proverbs 20, 10, 21 in the message translation said, The talk of a good person is rich fare for many, but chatterboxes die of an empty heart. So how is your conversation? Is it uplifting? Encouraging? You know, negative? See, we need to regularly speak in victory regarding the God that we know and the God that has promises what he's promised us, the God who gives us victory, who's going to help us and speak to other people, that God can help them and he will help them. The enemy wants us to use our words to do what he does, steal, kill, and destroy, to discourage our children, to alienate our loved ones, cause division and tear up a church, all those things. That's how he wants us to use our words. Proverbs 10, 11 says, The mouth of a good person is a, is a deep, life-giving well, but the mouth of the wicked is a dark cave of abuse. Proverbs 10.32, the speech of a good person clears the air. The words of wicked pollute it. Ephesians 4.29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So we're to speak words of faith, affirmation, moms and dads, grandparents. You know, you know, words frame the relationship that we have. And we need, you know, we're God's people. We need to be encouraging, uplifting. And I'm not saying to fake it. I'm saying that there needs to be time where we need to do what we've already done, talk to ourselves, get our soul in order, get our mind renewed to the word of God so that our conversation with other people can be uplifting and encouraging. Then the third conversation I want to talk about, which you probably never thought of, of is a conversation we have after we've prayed. After we pray. Now, obviously, prayer is our conversation with God. It involves us talking to him, but also listening to the spirit speaking to us. But, but I'm, not, I'm talking about what do we say after we prayed? Because I want to suggest to you that the conversation you have after you pray ha has much to do with whether or not you receive what you prayed for. You know, people can go to pray for something and then they can leave the prayer room or, or get up from their time of prayer and just begin spouting off all the negative things that they did when they went into prayer. Well, I can tell you their prayer is most likely not going to be answered. Now, now th this here, this formula, God's will plus faith plus spoken words equal answer prayer. This is not, you know, in stone necessary. God can do anything he wants. He can answer prayers that we are, don't even pray. 
But friends, you know, we in our prayer, we need to seek God's will. We, we need to attach our faith to that, that we're believing God's what his will is, and we're believing that God's going to bring it to pass. And then after prayer, after we sense all this, that, you know, what, what we say needs to affirm that we believe that that prayer is going to be answered. There is a spoken word component that I feel is very important. I'm not talking here naming and claiming and that kind of stuff. I'm not way out there in left field. But in some sense, prayer is the kickstart. It's the initiator. It's the channel by which we receive from God. But our words with prayer and with faith and God's will are a means by which that which was lost in the garden is restored. For example, in 1 John 5, 14 and 15, it says, This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. So, so that's really kind of in scriptural form explaining th that, that little God's will plus faith plus spoken words equals answers prayer. Some things we know are his will. We can pray for anybody that's not saved because God would that none perish but all have eternal life. That's a prayer that we can always pray. But there are other things that are not in the Bible. You know, sometimes we need to pray, God, should I take this job or this job? God, is this the house you want my family to buy and live in? Uh, God, is this the person you put in my life to marry? Uh, you know, God, do, do, do I need to go to this school? Are you leading people to the mission field? You understand. There, there's a lot of things that are not necessarily there, but we should pray until we have a sense of God's will. You know, or I've heard some people call it push prayers. P-U-S-H, pray until something happens. You know, pray, you know, what did Paul say? He said, I prayed three times. That's what it took for him to finally hear from God saying, Paul, I'm not going to answer your prayer like you want, but my grace is sufficient. So this is what I'm talking about. We're better off to wait until we have a sense of the will of God. And Paul says, don't be foolish, but know what the Lord's will is so we can know that. But let me take it a step further into the life of Jesus in Mark 11. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Okay, so there we have that spoken element. He, they heard him say it. Then later in Mark 11, we find in verse 20, in the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree, fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believe what they say will happen, it will be done for them. So we're not talking prayer here. But Jesus says, if someone says, and this is one of Jesus' favorite teachings. We know this because this type of teaching appears three times in the Bible. And it's not in the, the parallel passage of the Synoptic Gospels. I mean, it's not in Matthew or Luke in the same setting it is in here in Mark. In fact, in Matthew 17, 19, and 20, it says, Then the disciples came to Jesus privately. This is when they couldn't cast a demon out and said, Why could we not cast it out? He said to them, because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. Okay, let's go to Luke chapter 17. This is verse five and six. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like the grain of a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you. Now, this is some wild stuff, friends. I'm not pulling this out from some unknown place. This is Jesus speaking. And it says, you know, the grain of a mustard seed, I've got some things in my office, some key changes of things that have a mustard seed on it. It's really small. And the point about that is you don't need, need much faith if it's real faith. Amen? So go back to Mark 11. What's the lesson? Well, when, when you go to verse 24 in Mark 11, it says, Therefore I tell you, Whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. James 1, chapter 1, verses 6 or 8, kind of add this little caveat, caveat to that. It says, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts 
is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. When I, when I first came into Pentecostal church, and I was hungry for all the things that, that I felt like I didn't learn growing up in church, and I was just hungry for everything about Pentecost. And I, and I began reading everything about a man by the name of Smith Wigglesworth. Okay, that's kind of a fun word to say, but he was a, he was a plumber from England. He, he couldn't read anything but the Bible. His, his wife taught him to read. He wouldn't let anything in his house but the Bible, the newspaper, anything. I mean, this was a man of faith. I would encourage you to get some of his books. And I mean, great miracles happened through this man. And I, I remember that one of the things that, that he would often tell people was just believe. Just believe. And when you're praying, you don't have... What, you know, if you don't believe and after you've prayed and you have a sense of God's will, speak words of faith. That's what I'm saying. I'm not talking about, you know, being, being out there in crazy land. I'm just saying that if God gives you something, then you know what? You say it. You say it. The believing part of it that can be seen in what you say. If you believe that you have the answer from God, say it. You and I have the power to speak life or death, so let's speak life. Speak life. There's been many times in my life where someone has given me what we call a word from the Lord, okay? You know, now, people don't understand that. You and I as Christians understand that. Someone might come up and say, listen, I've got a word from the Lord for you. And it might be that you've been praying about something that nobody knows about. So what they say might be a confirmation where God is leading you. It's true because God gives us confirmation. Sometimes we're slow, okay? So you and I have the power to speak life or death, so let's speak life. Okay, now let's get back to the word Christian. And I said before we departed here that the question is not about the language we want to use, but what is the conversation that we want to have with people? I think there's a better way to describe ourselves, and that is that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I don't have to define that. I don't have to categorize that. I don't have to explain that. Because for me to say I'm a follower of Christ is true biblically. Because when you, you look through the gospel, what did Jesus tell everybody he came to? Follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Follow me. I'll give you water to drink. Follow me. Follow me. In fact, the Gospel of John was written so that we might believe. And kind of the stories in John begin with Jesus saying, follow me. And they end with, follow me. And, and Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So that's what we're talking about here. So what does it mean to follow Jesus? See, that's a different conversation as opposed to saying, I'm a Christian. And so you say that. Somebody says, "Who you know, what, what, tell me about you. Well, I'm a Christian. And, and so then they say, well, what kind of Christian are you? And you say, well, I'm, I'm a Pentecostal Christian. And then they go, oh, I went to one of those churches one time. And then all of a sudden the conversation goes off here. Or, or you might say, well, I'm, I'm a Baptist. And they say, oh, you know, I've got some Baptist friends. And they call themselves Christians. And whoa, you know, whatever. You know, what I'm saying is the conversation goes in a whole lot of different directions. Walk with me through the couple of verses in the book of Acts. And let me show you something here that's very powerful. In Acts 2, beginning with verse 36, verse 36, the story goes, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this, as Peter preaching, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Verse 38, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Go to Acts 3, 6. Then Peter said to the beggar that he came upon, silver and gold I do not have, but what I give to you in the name of Jesus. Walk. Acts 4, 8 through 10. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man that was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you today, healed. Acts 4, 12 and 13. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name. We know what the name is. It's Jesus. There is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men 
had been with Jesus. Acts 4.18 Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. You'll find the name of Jesus all throughout the book of Acts. It's amazing how back in that day the Sadducees and Pharisees tried to stifle the name of Jesus. They do it today. On his home improvement show, uh, Tim Allen was told he couldn't mention the name of Jesus in connection with the Christmas episode. Really. I mean, unless something's changed, Christmas is all about Jesus. Franklin Graham, son of Billy Graham, has created all kinds of firestorms when he goes around and he publicly prays because in his prayers he prays in the name of Jesus. If other preachers pray in some you know, generic God, there's no problem. But if you say Jesus, stand by. The politically correct police are going to pounce on you. And it's funny how all these who lecture Christians are how they need to be more tolerant have zero tolerance in our culture for when we talk about Jesus. Do you see what I'm saying? When, when the name of Jesus comes up, that's a whole different conversation. And make no mistake about it, the devil is committed to silence the name of Jesus. See, we're saved through that name. Amen? We become sons of God by believing in his name and daughters of God. We are forgiven through the name of Jesus. Jesus is present among us when we gather in his name, the Bible says. We are to do good works in Jesus' name. Give a cup of water in my name, he says. We are to preach in his name to all nations. Healings are performed by the name of Jesus. Mark 16, 17 through 18 says, And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them. And they will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. The name of Jesus has the power over the physical realm. Every kind of sickness yielded to that name. Leprosy, fevers, drops, even death itself yielded to the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus implies all authority, character, rank, majesty, power, and the excellence of Jesus Christ. The name of Jesus refers to the sphere of his presence. We can speak the name of Jesus because Jesus is actually in us and with us. We're not acting alone as a believer. The name of Jesus means in the authority of Jesus. We don't have to be an apostle to exercise his name. John said to him in Mark 9, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. And we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able to soon afterwards speak evil of me. Jesus is the only name recognized by hell. The name of Jesus made devils tremble. When they heard his name, they began to cry out, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? They knew who he was. Luke 10, 17 records the 72 return after Jesus had sent them out. With joy, they returned and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. There's a kind of little bit of a comical story in Acts 19 when the seven sons of Sceva attempted to drive out evil spirits by invoking the name of Jesus, saying, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Well, evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them. He gave them such a beating that they all ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Well, part of that tells us that we can, that Jesus is not a magic word. We, we can't just speak the name and then all these things are supposed to happen. There's got to be a relationship. He's gotta, we've got to be connected with him. Jesus is the only name that gets us to the throne of grace. When we invoke the name of Jesus, it changes the nature of the conversation. There's something about that name. Why do we pray in the name of Jesus? Well, when you invoke someone's name, you in some way evoke their authority. When you step into Jesus and follow him, you are the recipient of how the Father sees the Son. And in an everyday conversation, you put Jesus' name in the mix and great things can and will happen. When Jesus' conversation happens, it changes everything. Maybe because it's going to the beginning of when this all happened. We're bypassing the last 2,000 years of the way the word Christian has been, you know, misinterpreted or, or seen differently than what it has in the past. And so we're going back to the basics. I'm a follower of Jesus. I find it interesting that Paul in 1 Corinthians 2 says this, I have determined to know nothing but Jesus Christ, the crucified one. That needs to be us. Listen to these words from Paul in Philippians 2. He said, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ, 
who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself, <coughs> excuse me, nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Jesus is the name that is above every name. <coughs> Pastor Dick Foth. Uh, we had him at one of our Assembly of God Ministers retreats years ago. Uh, but Dick Foth, I believe, is the father-in-law of uh, Mark Batterson, if I, if I understand the story right. But anyway, he tells a story at one time of when he was a president of a Bible college in California. And he came into his office on a Monday morning and found a letter on his desk saying, do it, may concern. And, and he said, as a college president, you never want to walk in the office on a Monday morning and see a letter addressed to whom it may concern. It's usually bad news. But here's how the letter went. I'm making up the name here. It said, my name is Jeffrey. I came to this town near Santa Cruz when I was 15 years old looking for peace. And what I found was magic mushrooms and hallucinative drugs. I lived on the downtown mall in Santa Cruz for 10 years. Hundreds of students from your school would come by and tell us about God and Jesus and everything else. But none of them had any power. I eventually met a witch and went to live with her. I didn't believe in all of her hocus pocus. But over time, I saw some sordid things. Nothing in my life had changed until last Thursday morning when I was in another little town nearby with some friends and we found a van in the parking lot with a sticker from your college on it. And we were walking around throwing magic dust on it and putting hexes on that van. And then after a while, this blonde haired man with a mustache came out and looked at me and said, you came looking for peace. Do you still want peace? He said, I went crazy and tried to kill him, threw up on his van and I fell and started to cry. All my friends left me with this guy who had a power I didn't know. He looked at me and said, Jesus is Lord. And when I said that, and instantly I was free for the first time in my life. He said, I didn't know who this guy was. His name is Jim from San Diego. Please tell him I'm going home to Minnesota to see my parents, whom I've not seen in 20 years. Please tell Jim, thank him, and P.S., please put the same power in your other students. So Dick Foth said he called in student life president and said, find this guy and bring him here. They found him and brought him in. He was about five foot nine average looking, and he was normal. Dr. Foe said, I, I thought he might be like 6'5", and you know, woo, woo, you know, real, you know, kind of mystical kind of. And Pastor Foe started reading the letter, and, and this guy, Jim, just started to weep. And I said, you know, Pastor Foe said, do you do this all the time? And he said, I've never done this. He said, well, I was in the store. The Lord said, I'm going to show you my power. And he said, I walked out, and these hippie guys were going around throwing dirt on my van. He said, I, I walked up and said the first thing that came to my mind. Do you still want peace? He went crazy, like I said, and the only time I almost got in the flesh was when he threw up on my van. Friends, there's power in the name of Jesus. Let's have conversations that revolve around Jesus. Let's remember that there's power in our words to ourselves, power in our words to one another. There's power in the words that we say after we've prayed and have a sense of God's will. There's power in Jesus' name. There's a young lady by the name of Katie Nicole who, who has a fairly new song out and the name of her song is In Jesus' Name. And I, I just want to read the words to you and I hope that you can just go look for it online and listen to it. And it just says this, I speak the name of Jesus over you. In your hurting, in your sorrow, I will ask my God to move. I speak the name because it's all that I can do. In desperation, I'll see Kevin and pray this for you and then the chorus. I pray for your healing, the circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Verse two says, I speak the name of all authority, declaring best blessings, every promise he is faithful to keep. I speak the name no grave could ever hold. He is greater, he is stronger, he's the God of possible. 
Then again, the course, I pray for your healing, that circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name. Then there's a little bridge that says, come believe it, come receive it. Oh, the power of a spirit is now forever yours. Come believe it, come receive it. In the mighty name of Jesus, all things are possible. Then it closes with the chorus. I want you to bow your heads as I just say this, but, but I make it as a prayer for you. I pray for your healing. The circumstances will change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name. I pray for revival, for restoration of faith. I pray the dead will come to life in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord, that you're leading us to be followers of you and to mightily proclaim the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, one more time, thank you so much for spending your Sunday morning with us. If you would like to find out more about EAG, who we are and what we do, then make sure to connect with us at these social media links down below. We would love to hear from you and get you connected to our church family. Now that's all the time that we have for this Sunday, but make sure to join us again, same place, same time next Sunday, as we come back together for another terrific morning of online church. We look forward to having you join us. And so, until we see each other again, stay safe, take care, and God bless. Have an awesome Sunday, everybody.